Okay, everyone in this room right now is probably fairly confident that she or he knows Tolkien's works. We are the people that everyone wants on our trivia team when Tolkien is the subject. We all know how the story goes down to minute detail, or do we? I am hoping to show that we don't actually know the story as well as we think we do, not because of gaps in our own knowledge, but because of how the story itself is presented as mythological and historical texts written by in-universe narrators and lore masters. We can't know the full story. We can only know a very limited part of it because of the limitations and biases of those narrators and lore masters. I will review the evidence for historical bias in Tolkien's books and discuss the impact of that bias on how the text can be read. Next, I will discuss a group of Tolkien fans, writers of transformative works or fan fiction, who not only acknowledge but regularly, regularly use historical bias in forming their understandings of the text. The approaches they take to the books could be fruitful ground for other Tolkien fans and scholars to further develop our understandings of these works. The question, who wrote the Silmarillion, or who wrote the Lord of the Rings, or who wrote the Hobbit for that matter, ridiculous though it may seem, on the surface, is less simple to answer than one may expect. Tolkien's books give the impression of a narrator outside the action, omniscient and therefore able to dispense reliable judgments untainted by personal emotions and involvement. In fact, the exact opposite is the case. Throughout the development of his legendarium, Tolkien envisioned and assigned his various works to in-universe narrators and lore masters. Nor was this a mere contrivance, empty names appended to stories to give an impression of depth and historicity. Rather, Tolkien provided backgrounds for these narrators that, in some cases, exceed what we know about some of the more action-oriented characters who appear in the stories. The use of in-universe narrators has always been a hallmark of Tolkien's work. In his earliest work, begun in 1916 and published as the Book of Lost Tales, the story is explicitly presented as an oral tale told to the mariner Ariel. The characters who tell the stories are just that. They are characters who play a role in the story and have a clear purpose for telling their tales to Ariel. As Tolkien progressed in his work on his legendarium, the narrators would recede from the prominence he initially gave them in the Book of Lost Tales, but they would never disappear entirely. The 1930s brought two important developments relevant to the matter of the narrators. In 1937, The Hobbit was published, introducing a new thread into Tolkien's legendarium, which had been confined to this point to the Silmarillion material. Tolkien said of The Hobbit that, I didn't know as I began it that it belonged, but it proved to be the discovery of the completion of the whole, its mode of descent to earth, and merging into history. The Hobbit was presented in the same pseudo-historical mode as Tolkien's stories to this point. The runic inscription on the cover of the first edition of The Hobbit reads, The Hobbit, or There and Back Again, being a record of a year's journey made by Bilbo Baggins, compiled from his memoirs by J.R.R. Tolkien and published by George Allen and Unwin. For someone who bothers to transcribe the runes, the status and mode of transmission of the story as a historical work is literally front and center. Around the same time, a new in-universe narrator entered the tale. Pengaloth the Wise of Gondolin, who will be the narrator most relevant to my study. Pengaloth emerged in the 1930s, first appearing in the earliest annals of Valinor, and would remain through to Tolkien's late works on the Silmarillion. Pengaloth debuts as follows. These, and the annals of Valarian, were written by Pengaloth the Wise of Gondolin, before its fall, and after its Syrian's haven, and at Talbrabel, in Toleresia, after his return unto the west and they are seen and translated by Ariel of Levian, that is, Alfwina of the Engelkin. Pengaloth would continue to appear, often in the preambles to texts, or in marginal or parenthetical notes ascribing authorship to him of certain parts of the text for the next 30 years. Again, these were not mere contrivances. Tolkien often took care to distinguish which parts of the text were written by the lore master Rumil and which by Pengaloth. This suggests the considerations of the narrator's relationships to the text and a deliberate assignment of each text to the most appropriate narrator. Rumil handles the earlier and more mythological material. Pengaloth handles the later history, the philological materials, and amends Rumil's work where appropriate. In his 1992 article, Historical Bias and the Making of the Silmarillion, Alex Lewis documented how characters related to Elrond, Bilbo's most likely source for his Red Book of Westmarch, which Christopher Tolkien believed that his father very likely regarded as the Silmarillion, are treated with sympathy, while the Feanorians and characters associated with them, like Fingon, are at best given merely cursory treatment, and at worst are harshly judged. 
For example, Thingol, not exactly a font of benevolence and hospitality, is not only given extensive page time in the Silmarillion, but has his hostile actions de-emphasized. Mithros, on the other hand, is given slapdash attention to his heroic or benevolent deeds, with the emphasis falling on his history as a kinslayer. Lewis argues that Elrond, as a likely source for Bilbo's Red Book, portrayed his relatives more positively and subjected those opposed to his family, namely the Feanorians, to political bias, giving them less page time and a more critical assessment in what space they were allotted. Thingol, Lewis would argue, is an ancestor of Elrond. Mithros is not. The correlation he identifies between the characters receiving positive bias and ancestry with Elrond is well defended and makes sense. However, one doesn't even need to go as far as Elrond's familial affections and Bilbo's well-intentioned well but naive authorship of the Silmarillion based on Elrond's authority to explain the biases found in the Silmarillion. The same biases that Lewis observed would also have belonged to Pengaloth. We actually know quite a bit about Pengaloth's background, and it makes him an interesting and in many ways unlikely narrator for the Quenta Silmarillion. In the essay, in the essay Quendai and Eldar, Tolkien identified Pengaloth as, quote, an elf of mixed Sindarin and Noldoran ancestry, born in Nebrest, who lived in Gondolin from its foundation. Using the most recent timeline for the First Age, found in the Grey Annals, there were about 110 years between the Noldoran exiles settling their realms and the migration of Turgon's people from Nebrest to Gondolin. This is an interesting window in which to place the preeminent lore master of the Eldar for the simple reason that not much happens during those hundred odd years. Pengaloth is born after the Noldoran exile and the death of Feanor. He was at most a young child during Fingolfin's Feast of Reuniting, and so very possibly never met any of the sons of Feanor at all, nor Fingolfin, nor Fingon, and by the time the great battles of the First Age began, he was safely tucked away behind the walls of Gondolin. Pengaloth's status as a resident of Gondolin makes him a subject of Turgon, and complicates the political situation surrounding his authorship of the Quintus Silmarillion even further. During the crossing of the Helcaraxi, Turgon lost his wife, Elenwe, when she fell into the frigid waters of the north, carrying their daughter, Idril. Turgon was able to save Idril, but Elenwe was buried in falling ice and perished. Thereafter, he is understandably described as unappeasable in his enmity for Feanor and his sons, but this enmity very likely contributed to a political and intellectual climate that would not only have cemented a bias against the Feanorians in a young Pengaloth, but also placed certain historical inquiries off limits. After the fall of Gondolin, of course, Pengaloth would have witnessed much of the tumult that brought the First Age to a close, and Quendai and Eldar states that he collected stories from the elves living at the mouth of the river Syrian at this time. Among the refugees of the kinslaying of Doriath, he would have found enmity possibly even less appeasable than that of Turgon. At no point would he have found would he have ever been presented with the opportunity to speak with anyone associated with the House of Feanor, aside from perhaps Arathel and Gondolin, who was friends with Celeborn and Curithin. Tolkien gave consideration to the impact that Pengaloth's sheltered circumstances would have had on his development of linguistic knowledge, writing in Quendai and Eldar that, quote, owing to the isolation of Gondolin, Pengaloth didn't have much experience with the languages of the other peoples of Beleriand. It is fair to assume that he realized the same would hold true of Pengaloth's historical knowledge. Yet, this was how he chose to characterize his primary lore master of the Quintus Silmarillion materials. An interesting choice, to be sure. One wonders at the intention behind it. What all this means, though, is that the primary written source of the history that would become the Silmarillion was dreadfully ill-informed and biased. Many of the events that Pengaloth describes he could not have witnessed and it's unlikely that he ever spoke to anyone who did. One can only conclude that he fell back on conjecture in those instances, perhaps adding moral coloring that supported his preconceived ideas of various characters or that offered the possibility of political advantage. The burning of the ships at Lascar, the battle under stars, Feanor's death, where did Pengaloth find information about these events? Silmarillion fans sometimes wonder why Maglor and the other sons of Feanor didn't do more didn't do anything, if we assume the account in the Silmarillion to be correct, to rescue Mithros after his capture by Morgoth. Their failure to attempt to save their brother and king is one of many blights to their reputations, implying cowardice and the insidious influence of their oath. Perhaps they did try to save him. How would Pengaloth know if they had? And would he have revealed this knowledge even if he'd come upon it? And if he did take such a politically perilous chance, would Turgon have allowed the glory of Fingon, his brother, 
to be shared by the sons of Feanor, his enemies. Take nearly any episode in the Silmarillion and subject it to similar analysis, assuming Pengaloth is the source, and the account of that episode almost always becomes problematic. One could, of course, argue that Pengaloth doesn't appear anywhere in the published Silmarillion. He doesn't. This is true, but the reason is not straightforward, and while Pengaloth's identity as the writer of the Quintus Silmarillion becomes less pronounced in late revisions, there is no evidence to suggest that the texts themselves were revised with another lore master's perspective in mind. The removal of the in-universe in lore masters from the published Silmarillion was an editorial decision by Christopher Tolkien in response to discrepancies between the various drafts used to compile the published Silmarillion. The Quintus Silmarillion was identified as predominantly authored by Pengaloth until 1958, when Tolkien wrote on a scrap of paper that, quote, it is now clear to me that in any case, the mythology must actually be a mannish affair handed on by men in Numenor and later in Middle-earth. And indeed, Tolkien removed all mentions of Pengaloth in the B text of the later Quintus Silmarillion, which was revised between 1958 and 1960, very likely carrying out his intentions as expressed in the 1958 note. The texts themselves, however, were not revised to suggest a change in narrator. The 1958 note, like most of the texts preserved in its transformed, was never carried to fruition. And Christopher Tolkien later described his decision to remove the in-universe narrators from the text as, quote, an excess of vigilance. Since the Quintus Silmarillion was written, by in, was written with Pengaloth in mind as its narrator and never revised to suggest it should be read otherwise, it can be analyzed with Pengaloth's background and biases in mind. I conclude from all of this that Tolkien carefully constructed his legendarium as a tradition passed down by in-universe lore masters and narrators those lore masters and narrators possess their own biases, and those biases shape the narratives. This conclusion seems central to understanding and analyzing Tolkien's text, yet I have been hard pressed to find much of anything in Tolkien's scholarship that takes historical bias into account when discussing the text. Alex Lewis documented the historical bias of the Silmarillion, making a good case supported by ample evidence in the 1992 Centenary Conference volume co-published by Myth Lore and Malorn not exactly an obscure source, in other words, and yet his paper has been cited only six times, mostly in theses and dissertations by graduate students, and never in a peer-reviewed journal. This really isn't surprising. For one, it immensely complicates things when working with an already vast canon. To assume the text one accepts as part of that canon may not even be entirely correct. And it is relatively easy to dismiss historical bias under the assumption that Tolkien carefully selected which in-universe narrators would inform his books, and that the version he presented was the most consistent with what he wanted readers to see and understand of his world. Nevertheless, I believe that ignoring the historical bias behind Tolkien's books has a flattening effect on those narratives. Early critics disliked what they saw as black and white, good versus evil simplicity, and this criticism continues even today. Once one begins to mistrust those facts, however, and sees the stories as merely a single viewpoint of many potential viewpoints, and that viewpoint very often further constrained by political and social pressures within Middle Earth, the story deepens. The black and white so many critics see meld into shades of gray, and the stories of characters maligned or erased in the narrative begin to move to the fore. Take the House of Feanor, for example. The subject of Lewis's paper and the focal point of my study as well. Acknowledging Pengaloth's bias against the Feanorians leads one to question which details were selected and which were omitted, and which were never known at all in telling their story. This does not dismiss their misdeeds, but it does open the possibility of more complicated motives and context than Pengaloth's account acknowledges. For example, the Feanorians are condemned in the Silmarillion for their kin slayings at Doriath and Syria. And recall, Pengaloth used the people at Syria as sources for his writings. Very little attention is given to the fact that before making those attacks, in both instances, the seven sons attempted to resolve their grievance peacefully. Yet the leaders of Doriath and Syrian are not condemned for knowingly placing their people in harm's way, rather than attempting a diplomatic solution. Can you give me some water? Water. Thank you. It was in the room upstairs. Okay. I should have brought one. Thanks. <laughs> That's my husband. <laughs> I did not just randomly ask somebody in the audience to give you water. So don't worry, you're not next. <laughs> also unmentioned is the case for the leaders of Doriath and Syrian keeping the Silmarillion in the first place. 
probably because they had no case. Stealing an item that has itself been stolen from someone else doesn't confer ownership on the person who recovered it. Legally and morally, returning a stolen item to its correct owner is the proper thing to do, even if one underwent great hardship in recovering that item, as Luthi and Baron certainly did. This, of course, goes unmentioned, although it is noted that the people of Syria enjoyed extraordinary prosperity, which they attributed to the Somorel, a seeming red herring designed to direct attention away from the injustice of their keeping the Somorel and the especial foolishness of doing so, knowing that it was being pursued by a band of skilled warriors acting under the influence of a dangerous oath. None of this, perhaps, makes the Feanorians' recourse to violence a just or good act, but it does locate that act in a context that makes it much more complicated than the Somorellian acknowledges. Historical bias in Tolkien's works is widely acknowledged by one group of Tolkien experts. Writers of Tolkien-based transformative works are fan fiction. Although not generally recognized as such by the scholarly side of the Tolkien fandom, many of these writers are experts with considerable knowledge of Tolkien's world. And that's my bias, as <laughs> shown through there. As part of my work on Tolkien fandom studies, I am conducting a survey, still ongoing, of readers and writers of Tolkien-based fan fiction. Some of the preliminary data shown on the screen shows that Tolkien fan fiction writers have significant experience with the text, both in terms of years working with the text and the difficulty of the text they use. Perhaps this high level of comfort with the text, like the History of Middle Earth series, partly accounts for Tolkien fan fiction writers' awareness and use of historical bias. Fan fiction writers often plumb the lesser known texts for details on characters, groups, and events that didn't make the cut into the published Silmarillion or Tolkien's other major works. During this process, it is almost impossible to avoid encountering references to Pengaloth or the other in-universe lore masters. Furthermore, because these texts consist of contradictory details, it is possible that fan fiction writers become more comfortable with the ideas of the text as fluid and unreliable. It is difficult to quantify the extent to which writers of Tolkien-based fan fiction employ historical bias in shaping their interpretations of the texts and therefore their stories based on those texts. Although historical bias is a particular interest of mine and has been for over a decade now, I did not ask about it directly in my survey. In an international community, the members of which have varying educational and academic backgrounds, the term historical bias is understood differently, sometimes misunderstood entirely, even by writers who use the concept, absent the terminology, in writing their stories. Looking at the stories themselves is perhaps even more unproductive as a writer's motive cannot always be gleaned from the story itself. Instead, to document this phenomenon in the Tolkien fan fiction community, I chose to examine trends looking at which characters authors are writing about. Using Alex's Lew Alex Lewis's article to identify the characters who receive positive and negative bias in the Silmarillion, I then looked at the popularity of those characters among fan fiction writers. I chose two archives to conduct my investigation. The Silmarillion Writers Guild, site culture, encourages heterodox interpretations, allows open posting, and places no content restriction on stories. Stories of Arda is a more conservative site, placing restrictions on story content and requiring all new authors to be approved before they can post their work. Both sites have been in existence for at least eight years, making it less likely that a brief trend would skew the data, and they were both relatively easy to collect character data from. The graph you see is rather complex, but shows that writers of Tolkien-based fan fiction very often seem to prefer writing about those characters who were subject to negative bias in the text. Those characters whom Lewis identified as receiving negative bias in the Silmarillion are shown in red. As you can see, these characters have considerably more stories written about them than those who are positively depicted, shown in blue. Take the Feanorians, for example. With the exception of Amrit and Amras, every member of the House of Feanor had over 100 stories about him on the Silmarillion Writers Guild. Mithras alone had over 500. In contrast, consider those characters whom Lewis described as receiving positive bias. With the exception of Fingolfin and Elrond himself. Yay, thank you. You're awesome. With the, okay, now I have to find where I was. I I got so excited because the water arrived. Um, okay. With the exception of Fingolfin and Elrond himself, whom I will discuss further in a moment, none of these characters had more than 100 stories on the SWG archive. The same trends can be observed on stories of Arda as well, although less dramatically, since stories of Arda has far fewer Silmarillion-based stories than the SWG. However, 
that the same effect could be seen on stories of ARNA is important. I chose to collect data from SOA in part because it is the most conservative of the, lo of the long running Tolkien fan fiction archives. The first sentence of SOA's guidelines state that the site was, quote, created as an archive for stories based on and consistent with the world Tolkien created. If any writers were to take the text at their word about the relative morality of the various characters, I assume they would be heavily represented on SOA. However, even SOA writers show more interest in characters who receive negative bias over those who receive positive bias, suggesting that this is a phenomenon of the Tolkien fan fiction community, not merely writers who take heterodox approaches. The data in the middle, the orange bar for Fingon, and the pale blue bars for Fingolfin, Finway, and Elrond are presented separately because they also show how historical bias can, directly, can indirectly influence a character's popularity. Fingon is presented separately as a somewhat unique case. Unlike the Feanorians, he is not directly vilified, but at the same time, his depiction in the Silmarillion doesn't seem to do him complete justice either. Alex Lewis notes that, quote, Fingon, for some reason, seems to be played down as regards his, val regards his valor, noting that his deeds receive far less page time and positive attention than, for example, the deeds of Fingolfin. Lewis suggests that Fingon's po strong positive association with the Feanorians may have resulted in a slight bias against him. If my hypothesis is correct, and fan fiction writers prefer to write about characters who receive negative bi bias in the text, then the bias against him that Lewis notes would certainly explain his popularity. Fingolfin, Finway, and Elrond are also strongly associated with the Feanorians, although these associations are not as overtly positive as Fingon's. Yet association with the Feanorians seems to elevate these characters in popularity. To show how the Feanorians dominate in fanfiction about these characters, I compiled a word cloud of all the characters who co-star in the stories about Elrond on the Silmarillion Writers Guild. This approach isn't particularly scientific, but it makes my point. About half the stories about Elrond on the SWG also include at least one Feanorian. Mythros and Magmor are overwhelmingly the most frequently seen characters in these stories, aside from Elrond's brother Elros. Even though his time with Mythros and Magmor was but a blip in a long and storied life, they dominate in the imagination of fanfiction writers. Likewise, about 60% of the stories on the SWG about Finway include at least one person from the House of Feanor. But Fingolfin's numbers are the most dramatic. About three quarters of stories about Fingolfin involve someone from the House of Feanor, very often Feanor himself. One can imagine what Fingolfin might say about this. After having moved across the continent to avoid his late brother's family, and having distinguished himself with nothing less than single combat with Morgoth, the only way he can reliably get any screen time in fanfiction is as Feanor's pesky little brother. Take away the stories where these characters co-star alongside the Feanorians, and their numbers plummet and better fit among the rest of the positive bias group. Within the blue positive bias group, one other trend again points to bias as a factor that strongly determines whether fanfiction writers will choose to write about a character. Some of the more popular characters in the positive bias group are women, Luthien, Elwing, and Galadriel. When I shared, there they are. When I shared some early results of my research on my Tumblr blog back in May, I suggested that the women are better able to withstand the effects of the positive bias they receive due to the concerted efforts of some vocal members of the Tolkien fanfiction community in encouraging more stories about women. Certainly this could be the case, but one of my followers, Stentor Danielson, suggested an alternate explanation consistent with my hypothesis. Female characters are also subject to bias in the text. Much like Fingon, Luthien, Elwing, much like Fingon, Luthien, Elwing, and Galadriel are not vilified, but their roles are downplayed, in this case because of their gender rather than their positive association with politically unpopular characters. Baron, for example, is depicted as the hero in the chapter of Baron and Luthien, despite the fact that Luthien performs the more impressive and significant deeds. Likewise, Galadriel, who will become one of the most important characters across the Legendarium, receives almost no attention for what she was doing prior to her homeland just happening to get in the way of the male fellowship's quest in the Lord of the Rings. She is mentioned only 37 times in the Silmarillion. Once again, the sense that something is being omitted or distorted in the Silmarillion seems to encourage fanfiction writers to take up the cause of those characters, providing a more balanced view of their roles and a deeper picture of the history of Arda. Uh, 
I believe this proves that creating stories in response to perceived historical bias is a relatively common and long-standing approach among fanfiction writers. Documenting when anything unequivocally begins in the fanfiction community is, a di is difficult to impossible, since ideas are discussed and recorded in myriad forms online, some of them private or semi-public, others long ago erased or lost during site closures, and many difficult or impossible to search. When I began writing fanfiction in 2004, the concept of historical bias drove my earliest work, although I have no recollection of where I first learned of the concept. As a newly minted Tolkien fan, just beginning to grapple with the text beyond the Silmarillion, and unable to tell you who Pendeloth was even if he paid me to, I doubt highly that I thought of it myself. That I cannot trace my awareness of it to a single source or defining moment suggests that it was merely in the air during my early years in the Tolkien fanfiction community, much as it remains in the air today, a concept often discussed by writers in diverse forums or employed in dis developing stories. Fanfiction writers respond to historical bias in myriad ways in their stories. One of the most straightforward, and a use that Tolkien himself employed when he revised The Hobbit to better accommodate the plot of The Lord of the Rings, is to explain discrepancies or difficulties in the text as mistakes or distortions by those transmitting the story. For example, in late May, I posted to a discussion community for the Silmarillion Writers Guild asking about how members used historical bias in their stories. Fanfiction author Drummer Wench replied, in general, my work is pretty canon compliant, but I always thought it puzzling that the Palantir of Alas Tyrion was sent away west, like a snow globe of the Golden Gate Bridge being hand carried from Iowa to San Francisco. In one of my stories, someone explicitly states that the hobbits misunderstood about the Palantir leaving. Although this approach does not require, the hist require historical bias, it does necessitate acknowledging a fallible source, not an omniscient one, at the heart of the text. The many drafts and versions of Tolkien's text that exist, as well as the vastness of his world, lends his work to this kind of use. Writers can, and sometimes do, assume the array of different revisions to be akin to the multiple and varied copies of historical sources that often exist. Their work as authors becomes detecting and presenting the truest version of the story from several possibilities. More commonly, perhaps most commonly, Historical bias is used to develop a character or group beyond how they are portrayed in the text. This approach itself can take a few different forms. It can be used to elevate a character or group beyond their status as a villain. I take this approach in my own stories about the House of Feanor, for example. As articulated above, Pendelot's ignorance of their actual affairs and almost certain bias means that his account of nearly anything to do with the House of Feanor is inherently untrustworthy. When I write about them, I imagine how their story would be told by a lore master from within their own house. Errors and omissions can be remedied, but most importantly, I can seek explanation rather than condemnation of characters' actions. Along similar lines, historical bias can account for the relative absence of certain characters or groups, even when the texts don't necessarily attribute deviance or malice to those groups. Alex Lewis noted, for example, that the deeds of the Adain during the Nornathanodia received far less positive attention than the deeds of the Noldor, even though the Noldoran army was in shambles, arriving late, in my first case, and charging too soon in Fingon's. He attributed this dismissal of the Adain to the Noldoran lore master, and his interest in depicting the elves heroically. Fanfiction writers using this approach might, for example, write stories about the wood elves or the petty dwarves, assuming that these groups were merely overlooked by the in-universe lore masters as less interesting or important than the Noldor and Sindar. Similarly, fanfiction writers are often highly motivated by a desire there we go, to bring forth the stories and viewpoints of characters traditionally excluded from the historical record, such as women, queer characters, and characters of color. The screen shows how many fanfiction writers in my survey agreed, or strongly agreed, that they wrote fanfiction in part to explore the perspectives of these traditionally neglected groups. The data presented above for the relatively high number of stories about Luthien, Elwing, and Galadriel compared to the other characters in the positive bias group provides further evidence of this trend as it relates to female characters. Some writers defend the need for more stories about women, characters of color, and queer characters by pointing to the tendency of real world histories to erase their presence and contributions. The history of Arda, they contend, was possibly documented similarly. Certainly, as far as we know, 
All of the in-universe lore masters were white males, and given Tolkien's own conservative views of sexuality, it is likely that if asked, he would have identified them as heterosexual as well. While it was highly unlikely that Tolkien deliberately mimicked real-world erasure in his fictional history, as a heterosexual white male himself, and one steeped in literature and history already rife with erasure, he was likely inclined to maintain the status quo. Fan fiction writers sometimes view their role in remedying, as remedying this erasure. For example, in real world histories, women often don't exist or are sidelined in the roles of daughter, wife, or mother of an important man. Tolkien fanfic writer Wimmerdine coined the term textual ghost to describe them. Quote, the women who litter the Tolkien histories as textual ghosts, artifacts <clears throat> deduced by the presence of offspring or perhaps a name. My SWG co-moderator Elif identified 616 textual ghosts in Tolkien's works women nameless but identified by their relationship to a male character, or unreferenced women whom we know must have existed, such as the mother of Glorfindel. Fanfiction writers often not only name these women, but strive to give them identities and roles within the story beyond their relationship to a named character. Along similar lines, writers also analyze the re reasons why a particular in-universe lore master might have been motivated to depict a cultural group in a particular way using real-world experience with racism and ethnocentrism to infer that these groups were, in fact, much more complex than they appear from the biased descriptions they received. Perhaps the most significant example concerns the essay Laws and Customs Among the Eldar, which is part of the tenth volume of the History of Middle Earth series. Laws and Customs is a favorite among fanfiction writers for the sheer wealth of detail it provides on elven culture, everything from marriage ceremonies to naming traditions to sexual mores. Like many of Tolkien's texts, it is assigned to an in-universe lore master, the Anglo-Saxon Marinor Elfwina. It presents the Eldar as morally upright, temperate people, and the Avari as untrustworthy and mildly sinister. My SWG colleague, Independent 1776, has analyzed laws and customs in an essay that asks what motives the Eldar might have had for reporting details in a certain way to Elfwina, and what motives Elfwina might have had to record these details as he did. The potential for distortion, exaggeration, misunderstanding, including potential language barriers, and outright lying exists at multiple points in the creation of a document like Laws and Customs. The complexity of the transmission of this text motivates the creation of fan fiction, as authors infer what elven culture might really have been like. In another approach, writers consider how the in-universe narrators might have intentionally distorted details of a story for literary or mythic purposes. Thingol stares into Melian's eyes for years on end. My first Thingol from Thangaradrum for a half century. Or, as my SWG colleague, Janet McCullough John, has often noted, it seems like every other character is identified as the tallest. We are familiar with such mythic hyperbole from our real world historical and literary records, and some writers pursue stories where they explore what might really have happened during those episodes. Likewise, Writers sometimes explore in fiction the realistic basis behind the myths and magic of Tolkien's world under the assumption that the in-universe narrators were correct in their observations, but not necessarily in their explanations of those phenomena. Finally, historical bias can generate fan fiction that challenges the moral views of Tolkien's works. Tolkien possessed an explicit moral prerogative in writing his stories as he did, and he clearly invented fictional narrators and lore masters who would advance his moral views of key themes like power, progress, individualism, and technology. Assuming that the in-universe in -universe narrator selected and presented the story in such a way as to reinforce Tolkien's views on these themes, however, demotes these themes from moral absolutes with a strictly factual basis to simply one of many views of morality possible within his fictional world. One's values are shaped by culture and experience, just as in life. For example, many fan fiction writers, myself among them, question the notion that obedience to the Valar was virtuous, and that characters like the Feanorians were misguided in choosing not to heed their commands. My SWG colleague, Pandemonium, has used her fiction to challenge Tolkien's belief that technology is inherently suspect, and scientists and technologists liable to moral corruption. Other writers, again, myself among them, have challenged the idea that withdrawing from the world into the West is a morally defensible act rather than an abdication of responsibility to the wider world of which one is part. I was initially driven to study Tolkien's works by my desire to write fan fiction about them. I was a young 20-something civil servant with a background in the social sciences. If you would have described to me the research I am doing now as a graduate student in the humanities, 
I would have thought you more Faye than Feyenoord. Because I started in the fanfic community, I was inclined from the outset to read the text as biased historical works, and therefore to evaluate the veracity of everything I read. As my interest broadened to include the more scholarly side of the Tolkien fan fiction community, or Tolkien fan community rather, I was surprised that this wasn't a common way to read the text. Everything in the books was assumed to be factual. Luthien was the most beautiful woman who ever lived, Turin was cursed, and Feyenoord was evil, full stop. Tolkien fans of all persuasions will often remark that they are attracted to his books because of their sense of depth. Tolkien, inspired by works like Beowulf that have the same effect, deliberately set out to create a fictional universe that suggested deep layers of history and myth beneath every story he told. Alex Lewis suggests that Tolkien may have deliberately employed historical bias to create a sense of realism. I would go a step further and suggest that the historical bias in Tolkien's books functions to create that sense of depth. Every detail becomes open to inspection from different angles, making the world all but boundless. A story is never fully told and can always be retold from a different perspective, becoming all but new. The historical bias of the original text seems to invite such retellings. The very existence of the Tolkien fanfiction community attests to that. We are a community of fans who have found great value in analyzing historical bias in the text and using it to generate stories and art. And although I think that most fanfiction writers believe that they stand to learn from Tolkien scholars, this is one area where I believe that Tolkien scholars could benefit from the writers in hearing the tales of the lore masters of Feyenoord.